We are live.
good evening, folks. Welcome to the Marketplace Forum. It's a privilege to be with you tonight. My name is uh, Sam Mogorossi. Um, Dorian tonight is in the back and he will be with us at quarter to nine um, to uh, let us know what your questions are and uh, host the Q&A session. Tonight, we are discussing the corporate landscape. We've had so much uh, fun over the last few months or so talking to entrepreneurs, talking to pastors. Um, and tonight we are excited to be talking to some corporate leaders. Um, Chris Hall is general manager at, of West Africa at Colgate Palmolive. And there we've just got Chris on. Welcome, bro. Good to see you. Um, Dr. Samu Dube is general manager at Afrocentric. It's really great to have uh, you as well, uh, Samu. Um, lovely to be here. And really what we're going to be talking about is how do we bring the kingdom, as we've been talking about it over the last few months, the kingdom into corporate. So many of us uh, work for corporates, some small, some large. And, you know, the influence that we have in corporate can sometimes feel a bit smaller than what an entrepreneur has and a bit more kind of constrained within the corporate rules, but they can actually have more impact because corporates are much larger um, than, than kind of SMEs that we might, that we might own. So maybe just to um, jump into it and Chris, why don't we uh, start with you, bro, and, and maybe tell us a little bit about your job and, um, and your family as well and, and the church. Uh, over to you, bro. Great. Thanks, Yara. Yeah, I'm sorry. We've had a few internet wobbles this evening, so I've had to dial in on my phone. So I hope it's, it's clear. Um, yeah, but it's terrific to see you, Sam. And uh, thank you for welcoming me to join this evening and just to share a little bit. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Chris Hall. Um, I've been born and raised in Johannesburg. I was part of Every Nation, Rosebank, um, more than 20 years ago. And I've been part of the church for more than 20 years. Uh, married to Gudrun and got two great kids, 12 and 14 years old. So, you know... Like most of you, managing many hats and looking after family, business, uh, and working to be a better husband. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm part of the Every Nation Church in Ramsar with Carol and Andrew and, uh, and with Sam. And it's a privilege to be here with you this evening. Thank you. Yeah, juggling, working from home, schooling from home as well. <laughs> Fun times. <laughs> yeah, we're multitasking at uh, the highest level these days. Yeah, yeah. Sami, why don't you uh, go off mute and uh, introduce yourself as well. Really looking forward to hearing your story. Great, and thanks, Sam. Uh, uh, good evening to everybody. My name is Samu Dube, and uh, I'm, I was, I'm actually, I was born in Zimbabwe, and I'm a member of Every Nation since about maybe six years ago. I'm a born again believer. I'm married to one husband, uh, and uh, so my husband is a is a, 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 a visionary. He is based in Zimbabwe at the moment, uh, a member of parliament. We've got one daughter who is 14 years old. Currently, I work for the Afrocentric Group. I also juggle many things: business, uh, corporate, family. Uh, side hustles like creativity, etc. But at, at the end of it all, it's all what God has given you that you say, you know what, I'm gonna go all in. Thank Fantastic. you, looking forward to tonight. So, friends, uh, really good to have you, and um, looking forward to discussing what we've been talking about. You know, from Matthew 25, where Matthew reminds us that Jesus wants to build sheep nations, you know, nations that look after the, um, the, the vulnerable. You know, he says that when what we've done to the least of them, we've done to him. And we're looking forward to discussing how using our corporate uh, influence, we can try and turn this economy more towards a sharing and caring economy and away from corruption and greed. Um, before we get into it, Love to thank the guys at the back. So Dorian, I've already mentioned, he is uh, on the YouTube comments. Um, he's joined there by Dave Porter. Faithful Dave, hello, thank you again. Um, Charles Hellier at the back, making sure that technically everything's moving along and, and making sure that uh, this Zoom discussion is being, uh, 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 what's, what's, what's the word? Uh, broadcast out into 
the world of YouTube. Um, friends, please remember to like and subscribe. That just uh, helps the YouTube algorithm find us easier when uh, people come searching for us. So, um, some, you know, one of the, the verses that, that, that we hear a lot around, um, around marketplace ministry and, and being out there and representing Christ is Proverbs 22, verse 29, which says, do you see someone skilled in their work? They will serve before kings. They will not serve before officials of low rank. And um, certainly just following your career, that's very true for you. And I'd love to just um, tell us a little bit about your career, how you've been so successful, what, what has been, let's call it the secret to your success. Thanks, Sam. I wish there were secrets, right? <laughs> it, it's all out there. It's all out there. So for those of you who don't know me, I started off my career as a medical doctor. And you know, when you're a medical doctor, your life is kind of prescribed. I haven't seen a doctor who struggles to find work and uh, it's a narrow career path, it's set. You don't even go for interviews, right? You are called to the next thing in your career. But sooner rather than later, you often realize when you gain perspective, because for me early on in my career, I said, I want to go with God. And I said, God, give me, the, give me your perspective. How do you want me to view this career going, going forward? And when I went in the world and when I started gaining perspectives of what I could do and what I couldn't do with my life, I found out that I could, I, I, I could possibly do more than just individual patient journeys and you know, the healing uh, hand, as, 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 as we say. Yeah. And uh, uh, so I veered quite early on into the corporate space, into a commercial space. Initially, I started in public health space and then I went into commercial space because I think my quest was looking and seeing how healthcare was actually a scarce commodity in many of the African countries. I felt yeah. that you could impact more, you could impact nations, you could impact communities by either going public health initially as I did yeah. or sustainably so getting into business. So. I've worked yeah. with uh, uh, international organizations. I've worked with multilateral, multilateral organizations and multinational corporations, all in my quest to say, you know, we could change the face of how Namibian healthcare system is run and operated, South African healthcare system is run and operated. And this yeah. is what has brought me to where I am today. So I've seen that it's the it's God's perspective that actually helps you to move on to the next task or next job. And it, mine may seem like an eclectic career. So it hasn't been a straightforward journey, but there is a method in that particular madness. And I actually thank God for where, 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 where I've come from and where I am right now. And even looking at another perspective from the vantage point that I'm in. So, so, so uh, uh, I always have the mantra, Sam, that when you are born in a garage, it doesn't mean you're a car, right? <laughs> so it doesn't mean when you are a doctor, you forever just do that one thing that you trained in. I have like five degrees myself that have actually m m m helped me navigate the corporate space and spaces that are outside clinical medicine, but use the skills that I've gained from clinical medicine to actually uh, help in corporate South Africa. And I even, I've, I've even done some, 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 some work, entrepreneurial work where I've sold companies. So one, one company that I sold was actually in gluten-free products. Uh, some of the things may seem it doesn't have anything to do with medicine, but it yes. was that quest to actually find help for many a population. Brilliant, Samuel. And, and one of the things I love is when we were chatting over the weekend, when you said, you know, as, as, as fantastic as being a practicing doctor is, it's, it's the one-on-one, -on -one, you know, patient and doctor. But when you go into corporate, and that's a theme for tonight, is that it, it, it allows you a platform to reach the many. And, and, and that's been a, just a fantastic part of your, your story. And um, over to Chris, love to hear your story as well, bro. Um, rising uh, through the ranks at, at Colgate, um, now in charge of uh, Colgate West Africa, um, overseeing multiple countries in, in the West African region. Tell us your story, bro. Sure. Thanks, Sam. Um, you know, it's interesting. We've got Dr. Samu and I've got quite different careers and it just tells you what a kaleidoscope God uses 
Uh, we don't all have one chosen path, but uh, you know that's why we've got different paths, but one sort of destiny. And I, I've been with Colgate nearly 20 years. I've worked in 13 different jobs, and um, it's been very interesting because I'd never planned to start and be in the company more than two, three years. But you know, they guided other plans for me. And you know, when you'd asked me previously what are some of the keys or secrets to success, I think I would also respond: there's not too many secrets. But I think it's sometimes it's not how much you know, but how much you apply consistently. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And you know, one secret, it's like in the, on the stock exchange, people always wonder what's that one share that I buy? What's that one secret to success? The yeah. truth is it's about being consistent. And tonight, I really want to add in my heart just to share two things with, with everyone. And that is, you know, for me, two of the keys to success have been actually come, both of it comes out of James 1. Um, and it's what I would call grit or perseverance. And the other one is, is wisdom, God's wisdom. And, um, you know, in James 1, we read, <laughs> consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds. Um, because those trials, we know, you know, test your faith and produces perseverance. And too frequently, I see people coming into a corporate thinking, this is too tough, the politics are too hard, and they leave early. And, um, I, I recognize that if they stayed and had the grit, they could actually have really risen and made a real impact in that environment. So, you know, one thing I would encourage people is sometimes you do have these trials and perseverance and we need to have the grit to go through them. I mean, I've had 16 bosses in my career. Not all of them were great, but yeah. I learned something from every single one of them. Um, and then the second aspect, which, you know, I often tell people is, is you know, in, the Bible says that you can ask for wisdom and we should ask for wisdom. You know, there's no mm -hmm. blueprint to how to win in business. But if we keep pressing into God and saying, what is my role here? What do you want me to do? Lord, guide me, guide me through this difficult landscape. Uh, guide me, you know, in terms of using my influence for good. It's amazing what God will do. So, you know, these are two principles which have served me well over my 20 year career, which I, I continue to apply. That's fantastic. Perseverance and wisdom, godly, godly wisdom that we can actually uh, ask. In, in fact, doesn't James say, if any one of you lacks wisdom, just ask. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's actually... Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That's what it says, you know, and I, I think, you know, God, God is, is saying to us, just ask, you know, I, you know, yeah. knock on the door, yeah. ask. Uh, God is just willing. And, you know, I can't, I wish I could tell you all the stories where God is, in the moment, I mean, I remember being in a boardroom once and feeling all the eyes on me and just saying, God, I need your wisdom. And he put something in my heart and, I, you know, I emerged the hero. Uh, but I could have, could have gone the other way, you know. But, <laughs> but, but praise God, you know, for his peace and wisdom, even in, even in the boardroom. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that's so great. That's so great. You know, um, some of the next kind of section that we want to talk about is, is ownership versus stewardship. And... Um, you know, you, you, you straddle both worlds. Um, you've got a successful business uh, training and coaching doctors. Um, so you're an entrepreneur on the one hand, but you're also a successful corporate executive um, as general manager at Afrocentric Health. Um, can you talk us through kind of just what's been key for you in terms of influencing the course of, of a corporate where where you see a goal, where you see where God would use a particular corporate to just extend his kingdom, um, but you're not the owner. And so you've had to kind of um, be an influencer and, 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 and not just a kind of a dictator saying, this is where we're going because I own the business. Yeah, yeah, yes, Sam. I, I think uh, Chris has just uh, hit the nail on the head. Uh, wherever God blesses us, he actually has a purpose. And, and, you know, and you know, God uses things that you don't think he would use. In fact, he says he could use stones even, you know, to praise and worship him. So yes. don't never under, so if you are in corporate, never underestimate what your role is to actually steer the direction of that corporate in a certain direction. And I'll give an example of uh, uh, how uh, uh, I think we spoke about this, Sam, when we were talking about Coca-Cola, you know, the story of Coca-Cola in, yeah. in, in Somalia, right? 
So when, 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 when you are bringing Coca-Cola, not that we're encouraging everybody to drink Coca-Cola, but you know what I'm talking about. So Coca-Cola getting into Somalia, they managed to get the warlords. You know how Somalia was a, 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 a war-torn country. Nothing was actually working there. Every zone was managed by warlords. And, and, and when Coca-Cola got in there, the story is told. I mean, if you, if I, if you speak to the chairperson of the Coca-Cola Foundation, he will tell you this narrative because he was involved. The, the warlords become, became board members of the initial Coca-Cola establishment in Somalia. And for the first time in many years, there was water, running water, because Coca-Cola was there. How marvelous it is to actually get a corporation, you know, where, whether it was set in its ways or not, uh, whether it wanted to do this or not, ultimately what became of Coca-Cola's presence in Somalia was yeah. running water and unity. Even in my own career, I've seen that in, in spaces where, you know, you may have a vision, we need to do APC, and you find that your boss and maybe, maybe, maybe Chris, if you have 16 bosses, some of them don't even buy it. Like, what do you think we should do? I'm not interested in that. And you are like, oh, I'm going to leave. I'm, I just want to, I, because I just want to do this. And uh, the patience, the grit, the going all in, despite the fact that you're not having your way but you are allowing God in that space so that he has his way. Because remember, his ways are higher than our ways. So allowing him to use you even in those situations. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that yeah. we should just be, you know, lie down and let things be. We should always critically think because every leader in a corporate space needs to critically think. But for me, more importantly, for you to have that impact as a steward of what God has entrusted you with, you need to learn to lead yourself. So many of us, you know, we want to lead corporations, we want to lead organizations, but we can't lead ourselves. So when I learned early on that uh, if I'm not able to lead myself, if I'm not able to take care of myself, I cannot take care of things that are within my realm. Because how do you lead? There are people who come in and say, you know what, uh, Pastor Sam, we, we should actually get deeper into the, new, into the Old Testament. Let's study Jeremiah. But have you actually studied Jeremiah if you want to study it with, with, with Sam? So I think the yeah. same thing, if you're asking your yeah. boss to do APC, you yourself, you should be prepared to go through all in in that particular journey so that you are successful as an individual. You're representing God's favor mm -hmm. and grace within your realm so that the, 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 the corporation could be impacted. In the boardroom, Again, we should learn, I think, as believers to, 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 to understand that often for the, for the business, when they understand numbers, then you shift so that you also talk numbers in the boardroom. So where applicable, make sure that the value add is clear on, clear cut so that you bring it on the, in the boardroom. Don't just say, oh, we ought to do this because it's the right thing to do. Well, everything is the right thing to do, but at times you need to put bring in board, uh, numbers in the boardroom so that the value add of what you're bringing is clear. May God's wisdom guide us in doing so. Yeah, I, I, I like what you're saying about, you know, if we're gonna be good stewards, we have to be good stewards of ourselves. Um, you know, one of the things that I've learned from afar from your uh, career somewhere is just the way you just, you, you keep studying. Um, and I love how you just keep your mind uh, fresh and sharp um, through the many master's degrees that, that, that you've got. We don't have time to go through all You shouldn't them. mention um, those. <laughs> but I really, I really like that good stewards take care of themselves and what they've been given. And I love the, uh, the Coca-Cola story. Um, you know, just the power of a corporate to, to actually affect a whole city, a whole nation. Um, Chris, one of the things that you and I were talking about is, you know, in terms of influence, one doesn't have to wait for a title. Um, so when you are yeah. in corporate, when you are growing, you know, you don't have to be the CEO, you don't have to be on the exco to actually make a difference. Um, you can actually start influencing um, even, even at an early age. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, too frequently we we get stuck in this thought pattern of when I, then I, you know, when I become the CEO, then I'm going to make a change. 
But I think each one of us needs to understand that God's put us in whatever position we're in today to make an influence, to influence the environment that we're in. You know, one of my... The essence of that book is about wherever you are, you need to lead the people around you. And, um, you know, I, you know, I just want to encourage everybody to realize, don't underestimate the influence and the impact you have on your environment right now today. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the people that you're working with today may be the leaders of tomorrow. You may be a leader of tomorrow. But what God has got you is, is teaching you how to steward what you have and influence the people you have today. You know, I think about, you know, yeah. um, the fact that so many great ideas come from right throughout the organization. and. I think if we are, if we if we start with the confidence to say, I want to make an impact, you'd be amazed at what doors will open. Um, yeah. You know, I've seen young people get involved. I've had graduates get involved in projects that have had direct access to me as the general manager, because they volunteered. You know, they were willing to to test the boundaries of their influence, and before they knew it, they were running you know um, projects for the whole company. And so, you know, I always want to encourage people not to feel dwarfed you know you don't need to be the ceo to make a difference in fact you know god is training you now to lead and, and and influence the people around you you know we don't want to wait on developing these skills it's, it's, like, it's the skills that we learn on a daily basis that when we become leaders they become natural to us so it needs to become natural now and so i, I really yeah. think you can influence throughout the organization and i encourage people that I feel that, you know, it's only in the tone at the top that matters. I just want to challenge your thinking and say, God's put you where you are with the circle of, of people to influence. Go make Fantastic. an influence today. Fantastic. Uh, Chris, we, we lost you a little bit when you were mentioning the book that you love. Um, you oh, sorry. Want... So, yeah, it was uh, John Maxwell's The 360 Leader, um, which is, you know, a very easy read. And it's really just the concept of how you can lead throughout, you know, everybody around you. And, you know, I, I strongly believe, we won't get into it now necessarily, but I also believe that you need to nurture not only the relationships next to you, your peers, but the people below you, pulling them up, is upskilling them and developing them, and also looking ahead right. to what you want to become. So all three of these relationships are important. It's not just about aspiring to go to the next level. It's about developing and working with your peers, developing the people that are working for you and, and recognizing that you have a role in all three of these, these relationships in the organization. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 you know, one of the things that we really want guys to walk away from this discussion is, is really developing a vision for the amount of influence that you can have as you gain more authority in, in business. And I think one of the things that you mentioned, Chris, is when you look at your organization, um, the thousands of people that work there, the more than a hundred, I can't remember the number, uh, maybe you can just touch on that again, um, of, of countries that your organization is is in, and, and that just is a platform for, for godly influence um, across the globe. Yeah, so, you know, you... One of the, the benefits of working in a large corporation, and we're talking about you know, this ownership versus stewardship. Yes, you're not necessarily the owner. You still have shareholders and you need to you know, report to and develop uh, and, and meet their expectations. But you've got such a massive footprint. I mean, a company like, like I work for has got 35,000 employees globally. We operate in 220 countries. And so just think of that platform, right? Think of that and say, you know what, God, what if, what if more godly leaders rose up within this organization? You know, what if we could yeah. influence the nations through this organization? And, you know, what's been so interesting is even as I've traveled to different countries, I've had people in, at Colgate saying, hey, I'm a Christian. Hey, I know you. you my pastor told me you were at the church. <laughs> and, you know, I had a guy write to me once from New York. He said, oh, I went to New York church. I believe he used to come here five years ago, you know, and he works at Colgate. And so along the way, I've seen amazing how God has connected me with other godly leaders. It's, actually, yeah. you know, it's a platform to touch the nations. And um, it's a, it's, it, it, is, it gives you a, a reach that is beyond the small business. So there's pros and cons, but you know, that, that, 
the, the power yeah. to actually reach, you know, we have a, we have a program where we teach children to brush their teeth and the benefits of brushing their teeth. You know, cavities is actually the, the, the something that almost everybody suffers from. I'm not going to turn this into a business, uh, uh, call yeah. conversation, but you know, if you think about, we've educated a billion children through the power of some of our programs. So, you know, you just think of that scale and say, if we can, if we can harness big corporation scale and programs, um, and we can make such a huge positive impact on the nations. It, it's, uh, it inspires me in many respects to say, you know, there's a place for corporate and there's a place for, for the Christians in the, in the corporate world. Yeah. yeah. And some of you as well, I mean, with where you are now at Afrocentric, um, where you were at Philips and some of your other uh, positions, there's always been this theme of how can we improve healthcare in Africa, specifically Southern Africa, um, and, and again, using the corporate muscle and the corporate platform to, of course, be a good steward of what you've been called to do at your job, um, but at the same time, really roll out that, that, that national vision that, that you have um, for the community and for the nations. Do you want to just unpack that a little bit, uh, a little bit for us? Yeah, 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 sure. So, so with, within corporations, and, and interestingly, as, uh, as Chris is talking about the, the, the ability of corporates to influence nations, to influence the direction of travel of a sector, it's because in, within a corporation, it's people and individuals who work there. So if you're one of the individuals yeah. who's working in a, in, 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 in a corporation, you've got the power to direct how a corporation could actually go. Some of the, of the, of the work, the deals that I've done in my life, uh, uh, it, it was because I sat down and I'm like, but how do we change this? Where you actually are not sleeping and you, you are uncomfortable about the status quo. And you are like, God, I want to go all in because I've gained your perspective. But in this project, I'm going all in. I don't know whether you've seen those projects where you wake up very early and you are in the war room to say, guys, this is a must win. We are going to do this. So that's what I've applied in every area where I've uh, uh, gained perspective that says, you know, there is the now, there is the, there is the future and how I want the future to go, it should be about influencing the healthcare, the direction of travel in healthcare. Look at healthcare, Sam, um, I mean, in the continent. Really? Is, that, is this mm. what we can produce? I think the need mm. for whatever you are seeing now, I'm sure you need double and more you need double and more doctors. You need double and more facilities in Africa. We need double and more, and we know we can. So if we actually put together our assets, including our intellectual capital, including our ability to create, God, I think, has given us all the ingredients that we need to actually develop this particular sector. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm particularly intrigued. Uh, so in some of the spaces that I sit in, in South Africa, we often talk about supply-induced supply demand. We think we've got too many beds, too many hospitals. But I'll tell you, some of the African countries where I've traveled, there is barely a functional hospital. If it's there, it's, it's, it's out of the reach of many. If you go to the public facility, people die sitting in benches. And these are problems that we can actually solve. No one can solve this for us. So for me, I think the quest for moving from just a, a clinical approach was to provide an infrastructural environment where doctors or our children who often aspire to be doctors sh shouldn't have to emigrate to Canada emigrate to the US for them to practice medicine. Yeah. I think we can create it here. Yeah. If we put all our heads together yeah. and say, even a company like Afrocentric, we've got the muscle enough to actually build sustainable healthcare models that could be emulated elsewhere, elsewhere in Africa. One of my qualms though, especially about where we sit in South Africa, I think we are endowed with so much, we may not realize it, and I think we ought to do more. South Africa's hegemony in Africa, we, it's easy to get a, a, a Nando's or a, a, a ShopRite, 
out of South Africa, but we haven't been really able to export healthcare. And, and yet at many, many, many of our counterparts from the continent still come to, to seek healthcare here. It's an opportunity waiting for kingdom investors to actually get into. And I think, I, I think we should. This is something that I'm pushing even within my own entity. I wanted to also say, uh, 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 as Chris was, was, was talking, Sam, if I may, uh, just, just, just one of the things around mm. being, you know, have modeling followership when you are a leader. So, or, or even when you are in a position of, of stewardship, you should always be a follower that somebody can also follow, you know, even if you're not in charge. And also above all, examining your heart. So in corporate, we compete, we fight for things, you know, we play the corporate politics, we make sure that our project wins, uh, et cetera. But at the same time, we should examine our hearts so that our hearts are also in the right place. You know, our hearts are not those hearts of envy, like I'm, I'm not gonna do this, I'm moving out, I'm doing whatever. Your heart, you should examine it above all else, even when you're in the corporate mm -hmm. space, so that you are a model of followership, so that people can follow you when you are also in a position of influence and a position of power. But believe you me, corporations actually can mm -hmm. change the direction of travel of economies. And when, when we look at where we started with corporations from Stone Edge to where we are now, we ought to shape corporate, not necessarily always the other way around. It's individuals who are working in corporations to actually drive sustainable change. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, I think for me, um, Chris, one of the things that's, that sticks out when I look at leaders in the Bible, I look at Daniel and how he was undefiled by the Babylonian culture around him. I look at Joseph and how he was able to stay true to his values, um, true to the word of God in completely ungodly circumstances. And one of the things that, that Samu touched on is, is, is playing politics. <laughs> and so maybe if we can just uh, touch on that as in, in the broader context of, you know, sometimes a challenge with corporate is that, um, you know, some of the values may not align with your own values. Some of, you know, there may be ethical situations where you have to put your foot down and, 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 um, and, and really challenge the status quo. Um, we discussed a few uh, examples uh, over the weekend. Do you want to just touch on some of that, uh, Chris? Absolutely. Yeah, thanks, Sam. I think it's one reason many people want to avoid a big corporation is they say they can't deal with the politics. You know, earlier I said there was no secret to success, but I guess there is one secret to, to happiness and purpose in the workplace, and that is finding a company whose culture and values aligns with yours. And this is so critical because I don't think I could survive mm. in any business necessarily. You know, sometimes God places you in a place for you to learn and grow. Sometimes God places you in a place to influence the environment that you're in. But there's some environments which are just so hostile that honestly, it would be you know, a, a very difficult situation for you to find purpose and happiness. And so you know, I really encourage people when they're looking at a corporation to understand the values of that corporation and the mission statement and what it stands for. Make sure it aligns with your heart. It's going to be very difficult to actually find purpose and influence if you have a misaligned values. So that's the third, first thing I would say. Um, you know, the second thing, is I would say is build the right role models in your life. You know, I, you're going to meet all kinds of people in the corporate situation. You're going to meet the schmoozers. You're going to meet the manipulators. You're going to meet a variety of people. And you know what? Some of them are very successful, okay? You need to choose who do you want to be? Who do you want to emulate? And, and, and just like you saw Daniel in the Bible, I, just, I, I truly admire him and I can, I can picture him focused on the word, focus on the Lord, and doing that which God has called him to do. And over time, his value was, you know, and, and the fruits of his labor were so evident to all. You know, I, I think it's such a critical component is that we need to, you know, like, you know, Colossians, Paul writes and says in, you know, Colossians 3.23, I think we know it well. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart is working for the Lord and not for human masters. 
You know, and I found that to be true it's because, you know, boss, bosses come and go, trends come and go. But at the end of the day, I need to be com- confident and comfortable that my values, are, I go to bed at night knowing that I've been, you know, true to my values and not being swayed by the, the values in the mm-hmm. company. And, um, you know, so, so it's important to, to make sure that you know what your values are, what you're going to stand for. And also have the wisdom yes. to know when you're going to stand up and fight, you know. I mean, I, I mentioned to you over the weekend just you know, a couple of examples. And, you know, one of them was, you know, I went to a supplier once and uh, I sat down. It was a new supplier. I actually was evaluating four or five suppliers, sat down and in his boardroom and, you know, very nice wood panel boardroom was in a legal office. And, uh, you know, the, the, the tea lady came in and, and the way in which he treated her was just horrendous. And I actually just politely said, you know what, I think we've seen all, he was just about to start the presentation. I said, I think I've seen all I need to about your organization. And I got up and politely left. Um, but if he's going to treat his team like that, I'm not going to want to, I know it from the get-go, that is a misalignment of values. And, uh, and so I think it's important to know when you're going to put your foot down. And when there's times you just need to, you know, pull yourself out of a bad situation. You know, I spoke about earlier, about perseverance, you know, but, but let's be clear, trials and perseverance is one thing, but temptation is something different. You resist temptation. You don't mm. try to go through the trial of temptation. Mm. So when somebody tempts you That's with something, so when you, your value, champ, you need to resist. You need to say, no, this is against my value system. You know, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to turn a blind eye to that situation. And so it takes courage and if you see it in the organization, you need to be aware that at some point you're going to have to put your foot down and say, I'm sorry, that's not for me. And, you know, I remember yeah. once confronting somebody and I actually said, I'm sorry, we cannot have this conversation. And they got so like shocked at my reaction that I just, you know, they were actually quite embarrassed. Um, but, you know, they were pushing a line that was not, mm-hmm. not in line with my ethics. And so I think it's important to know when you need to draw the line and, and as you grow in the organization, you grow in confidence, of course, because you grow in power. But, um, you know, so, so, but it's important to learn to establish that, you know, at any point in the organization, at any point in your career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I started my career in, in the dealing room of, of a bank, you know, and um, I remember just having to, to completely uh, resist the temptation as my colleagues kept saying to me, you know, as part of our culture, we, we go out to strip clubs together as a team, you know, you must join us, Sam, you know, and, and some of the, those are some of the times when you have to put your foot down and say, no, thanks. I'll see you tomorrow, bright and early. I'll be uh, as sober as a judge on Sunday, <laughs> yep. but um, some, uh, yeah, you, you do have to put your foot down. Um, some on, in your front, I mean, examples or times or situations where you've had to say, you know, my values are, 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 are being misaligned here and, um, and, and we're going to have to figure out how to, how to deal with that. Yeah, I, I, I think there are many. Uh, I, used to work, I used to work with Philips and where you're working with distributors and where you are working with, uh, with I used to drive a portfolio where I would directly go and work with ministers of health in, in, in Africa. And hey, man, I like in those meetings, even with ministers of health, they're like, okay, can we meet again for dinner? But we just had a meeting. Can we meet again for dinner? And you know what, things are not going to be okay there. And so you have to be brave, you have to be bold. And once you confront a minister, often you know that you just have to walk away. And fortunately, and uh, uh, as Chris, Chris said, you know, choose a company whose values are aligned with yours. Fortunately, my company would understand when you walk away. So you know when, when you have turned away the minister, yeah. that you know what? this deal is not ours. So in many circumstances, I think I can count two or three where in with, with a higher echelons of power, yeah. a deal never happened. And I remember Those actually- apologies the, with the, the load shedding. Okay, so there is-, there is With the a, load shedding, we've had all sorts of challenges with the data connections. Um, Chris was struggling, I was struggling. 
Okay, okay. But can you can you hear me okay, Sam? I can, I can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. And, and I think you were just highlighting the fact that when, when values are aligned, when you push back, you know, you want to be supported by your boss, you want to be supported by, by the organization. And that's why it's so important. 100, 100%. And you know, values for me at the core, they are hallowed by, uh, you know, integrity. They are then hallowed by ethics, where you actually do want your board, you know, where there is, uh, where, where the, 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 the social responsibility or ethics committee sits. You want them to actually support you. You want them to state those values. For us as Christians, our, value, our, our values are often detected by who we believe in. And that mm. is, the, then there is integrity, then there is ethics, then there is the legal uh, uh, framework of where we work. Choose, you know, uh, uh, to play right through because you're not going to do something illegal and still say, and still say you know, you are a person of integrity. Mm. And, and, and I think those issues are key to how we would thrive in corporate. And, and again, Sam, there are some issues where we say it's values, but it's actually your own thinking around mm -hmm. where you think an organization should go. We spoke mm -hmm. over the weekend where you're sitting in a, uh, uh, I, I sit in, in a social responsibility committees where you have to decide how to allocate funds or how to allocate your money. And, and you know that there are some things that are just like tick boxing, tick box exercises. Yes. I think again, as Christians, you want to watch, you know, watch ourselves when in those meetings where we just want, can it just get over? And you yes. don't dare to, to challenge because it's difficult. We don't dare to challenge because we don't, we, we don't want our values to actually be known in that mm. uh, particular situation. So mm. I think uh, I have steered us from painting a school, for example, and just doing tick box exercise to investing in real sustainable projects that actually would drive healthcare in a certain way and actually is aligned to the ethos of the organization. I think when you want to live your values, you need to be bold enough to stand for them in a big way. And that is difficult. That's where you need to go with God, that's where you need to be wise. Mm. Mm. No, fantastic, fantastic. Um, Chris, one of the things that we've been chatting about then is, you know, how do we use our influence as believers to, to help move our corporations towards a more caring and sharing uh, economy. Um, you know, in South Africa, we're dealing with so many big challenges around poverty, around inequality, around unemployment. Um, right. and, 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 you know, God has, has placed us in these corporations to, to, to have an influence. Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I guess a couple of thoughts. I mean, I, you know, one is, you know, I've been wrestled with this myself, you know, over the years. And I think what I've gotten up to is, is two concepts. And, you know, if you look at what Paul talks about in, in Corinthians 12, he says, you know, we, we just like we're one body as many parts, you know, many parts form one body. So it is with Christ. And, you know, the, you know, the foot can't say because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, etc. And I think, you know, what I take out of that is that your corporation has got a core competency. And so if you really have a heart to to see a change in a certain area, go and line yourself with a company that has a heart for that. So I think if the companies like would do, would focus on their core competencies and leverage what they had for more scale. So for instance, we sell toothpaste and start bar soap. If we can leverage that scale, there's so many needs, basic needs in the sense that across all to some extent um and and so we need to you know i need to focus on i need to try to focus on how do i leverage the core competencies of my business to meet sp specific needs in society other needs will be met by other corporations i can't do it all so what is my role within that and the second part is there might be personal things that god's still calling me to do in my personal life it's not all up to the company you know so if god has called me chris and yeah. and you know to invest in, in my own personal capacity, sit on other boards, be involved in other activities. I, I shouldn't say, well, my business isn't involved there. So we need to be able to, to recognize that we've got, you know, the ability to do both. And um, I would encourage people, you know, make your passions known in the workplace. You know, I, honestly, I know the people that have had the brave, who are brave enough to say, oh, I love dogs and I'm involved in, 
you know, dog shelters, whenever there's something to give, you know, the company's given towards that. So I would just mm-hmm. encourage if you're in a corporate to, to make it known what your passions are. Um, and you'd be surprised. Very often you can actually get funding, you can get, you know, support. And, and the company will actually, companies like to latch onto passionate people with passionate projects. So don't be afraid to, to let, some, you know, yeah. with wisdom, let some of your passion shine in, in the workplace. Yeah. yeah. And Chris, one of the things I loved is, you know, Colgate, Palmolive being strong in, in, in kind of the, the personal care space um, and COVID-19 hits. And, and you mentioned how, you know, you guys have been so instrumental in, in, in pushing the hand washing um, part of, of, of COVID and, and kind of sticking in your lane and using the corporation's um, key strengths and, and competencies to really uh, help uh, make the world a better place. Uh, Someone on your side in terms of corporations um, changing the economy, being more caring, more sharing? Yes, certainly, certainly. Before you, you share, you need to create, right? So I think uh, 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 ensuring that the bottom line, uh, you are creating value as a corporation is, I think, very important. When you create that value, you need to share the value. So we often speak about shared value concept for, for corporations. And I think that is important. When we're sh- saying uh, shared yeah. value, it's not just about CSI. It's about how do we create sustainable economies uh, that can employ more people? Because in my space, you know, I, re- I rely on more employed people who are able to contribute to their own healthcare. So when economies slide, people are not able to take care of their, actually the first thing that falls for many people is medical insurance or even life insurance. So I rely on functional economies where people have shared value so that you know other sectors, especially what we call social sectors would thrive. So it's important therefore for us as Christians, as children of God, as stewards of what God has entrusted us with to actually run these corporations so that they do create value. What is your role? You, 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 you have in that Venn diagram that says, you know, where is your passion? What you are doing? Do you really love it? Can you even do it for free? Uh, can somebody pay for it? Is it making the world a better place? And, uh, you know, where this, this intersects, that's where you want to be. And examining this every day with a long range perspective, I think it's important for us to know what our space and impact is within a corporation. But corporations ought to create value in a sustainable way for them to share the value. And we are seeing this more and more uh, within the, with the COVID-19 about these corporations and how they should uh, create this value. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. While I uh, while I call up Dorian, bro, if uh, if you're ready for us, you can uh, pop in. But one of the things that I wanted to reflect on that you shared uh, with me earlier, uh, Samu, is you know Bill Gates. He had that vision to have a computer in every home, and um, and 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 it's arguable to say that actually had more of an impact for society, a positive impact for society um, than his great foundation that's giving away money and, and, and investing in, in healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. But, but within making a profit, selling a product, doing business, um, he actually changed the world. And, 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 and if we can learn how to harness the power of corporate to, to positively impact economies, positively impact the world, um, that, that, that's something that, that we should be looking to do. 100% Sam. And actually, when, when, you, when you read the story of how he started, when the computer was big as this room, or even bigger than this room, he had that vision that I will put it in every house. And for me, it's that vision that says, it's, it's dreaming as Christians, saying we ought to dream about something big, hairy, audacious dream and make it real and work towards it, grit, so that you can create value for you to then share value. Now we're benefiting from Gates Foundation, even with this COVID-19, I think they're one of the greatest contributors to this, but thanks to the computer, because the vision actually started with the computer, which for me is beneficial for everyone, even though some of you are using a Mac, 
but I know that Microsoft <laughs> actually has done more uh, than, 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 than uh, uh, even the foundation itself. No, great, great. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm on my Mac, but I do have a Microsoft Word document <laughs> that I'm working on here. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, um, folks, I, I just want to say it has been an absolutely tremendous session. I hope you've been having fun on that side because it's been amazing on the other side. And um, and just before I climb into the Q&A, um, I think it's just so exciting to see uh, people so passionate about God's calling on their lives into that corporate space. Because I think if it wasn't clear before, it is absolutely clear now mm. that when God calls you into that corporate arena, even though your ownership and therefore your ability to make decisions and just make it happen because you're the owner is a lot more limited, the impact can be so much significantly greater. And I think that's why it is so exciting to see people like yourselves called into corporate. And I think what's very clear is it's not the booby price. It's when God calls you into corporate space, Whatever you do, don't get out of it because there's a reason and there's a, you know, there's a purpose in that. So thank you for that. So there are a few questions. And, um, and uh, so, so we're going to see how many of these we can get through. Uh, but Dr. Samu, um, there are, the, the first one we've got here is a question that says, what has your experience been as a female executive? And how, if any, have you managed to navigate challenges of gender discrimination in the corporate world? An interesting one. I, I, I almost suspected that something like that would come, Dorian. Uh, it, so I've somewhat grown uh, to understand that there is a way, in fact, there is a need for some femininity within the corporate space. I think we think differently. We bring in the diversity that is needed to actually run corporations and realizing that as an asset is actually an important uh, uh, contribution in the corporate space. Of course, I've, 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 I've uh, 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 been discriminated against. Of course, I've stood up to my bosses to actually challenge them, uh, challenge even, you know, uh, I remember standing up to, to somebody who, who said, are you angry? at me and I said, no, 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 I'm not angry because they people often go into the emotional space when they're dealing with female executives. I said, I'm not angry, I'm actually disappointed. Shall we continue with the numbers, gentlemen? And you often brush that aside because for a long time, especially black women adoring, they're like, you know, you are angry. The problem with you guys is that you are angry. Of course we are angry and we know that. We are angry because we've been beneath the scum for a long time, but that doesn't make us lesser of human beings. That actually makes us disappointed that people do not acknowledge the need for that diversity and the contribution, the great contribution that female executives, mm. female entrepreneurs actually bring into the mainstream economy. So I've been disappointed, but the thing is when you go with God, God actually fights for you because God actually doesn't see gender, doesn't see color, doesn't see, and, and when you have these as supporters in your life, they actually will hold you back. When you go in there as a child of God and not just as a female executive, you actually have got a compounded uh, uh, power base with you when you go into the boardroom. It is not easy. We have to work 10 times harder at times, but you know what, we can do it and I know women actually in the workplace, they often perform even better. And that attribute, that X factor is what you need, Sam, in JSE and Dorian, where, where, where you work. And, and Dr. Simon, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, and I, I, I wanna actually ask a second part of that question, which I want you to just think about for a while, and then I'm gonna go to Chris. But as, and I think what you're saying is just so powerful. And, um, and as a man in the workplace, I, I have to put up my hand and say, I'm sorry for times when we've made it harder for women in the workplace. But what I'd love you to do is think about what advice can you give us as men to make it easier for women to be all God has called them to be in the workplace? What can we do differently? How can we make that path easier? Not a free road. I'm not asking for kind of, but how can we be better as men to make it simpler for women to be all God has called them to be in the marketplace. So maybe you can just give that one some thought for a moment. 
Um, but Chris, um, the question that we've got for you, mate, is this one. Um, now, you're faced with a political situation uh, in the office environment. And I guess the one question people have to ask themselves is this. Do you actually need to enjoy politics to an extent in order to survive in corporate? Or can you get along in corporate and thrive in corporate by not enjoying politics? I, um, good question. I, I don't think I personally enjoy politics, to be honest. Um, but I think that I've had a quiet confidence that God's got my back, you know, throughout my career. So I, I would not describe myself as a political animal in terms of the way I've navigated through the waters of the, the organization, but I've, I've seen God's wisdom to guide me through it. You know, many times <laughs> I often say to people, God gave us two ears and one mouth. So maybe we should listen twice as hard as we speak. And, you know, even the barbs in, you know, in your anger do not sin. You can get upset, but don't, don't always engage. And I think that sometimes I've learned that sometimes you need to steer clear of the politics. You know, let, let, the, let the buffalo at the top weed themselves out. And very often a, a path is created for you. Now, I think I've shared with you that, you know, uh, I, the, the reason I was put into this role is because, you know, I worked as a marketing director for Sub-Saharan Africa for a number of years and then I went over to Ukraine and the team that was left behind was so busy you know they were fighting over different things and and they made some decisions which short term were great but long term were painful to the organization and you know part of the the reason the company brought me back was that you know even though it's a, it's a, they needed somebody trustworthy somebody that they could put into a region which nobody understands that if, that the risks are high they need somebody trustworthy. And over time, I think I've built that trust with a lot of senior leaders that I don't always get involved in the politics. I do what I, I do what's best for the organization, even at my own personal sort of detriment sometimes. Um, and I believe that that's what's that, you know, that's proven itself over time. So I don't think you have to be the greatest politician. I think sometimes you need to know when to speak, when to be silent and to stay true to your knitting to your calling that God is, sometimes you have to engage, absolutely. I'm not saying chicken out, but sometimes you just need to recognize when, you, when do you have to back up and when do you need to engage uh, and, and through it all be consistent in terms of what you deliver because ultimately I think that consistency pays off. Tremendous, Chris, and th thank you for that. I mean, I think that's often one of the, one of the things that people just get out of corporates too soon or, or bail out because they feel like, well, I just don't want to play that game. And it's so good to hear that one doesn't need to. I guess one needs to be aware of it, but one doesn't need to be able to play it. I've got one more question for each of you. I think Dr. Sama have already given yours, but Chris, while Dr. Sama's answering, you mentioned earlier that it's often the simplest things in life that have the greatest impact, that are the most life-changing, that steer an organization in a way. Could you think of what some of those simple things are that you've either applied to your life or given to the organization, to the corporation that have had the biggest impact, um, you know, and so I'm going to hand over to Dr. Samu to answer the question around a man and what we can do. And then Chris over to you and straight to you, Sam, after that then, my friend. Sure, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Dorian. Uh, 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 what, what Chris was talking about, perhaps women would actually are the first ones to leave, uh, you know, when we deal with talking about that corporate politics. I think there are things that men ought to do and could do, particularly to men uh, in, 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 this, in this audience. If you are in a position of power or influence, hire women, actually. We know the multiplier effects that hiring women actually does have also with, with the economy. Hire women, work with them and pay them well. Promote them and pay them well. So I think that's actually uh, something that, uh, that could work uh, in the workplace. The other thing is acknowledge women for, the, for, for what they would have done in the workplace. Give them credit. You know, we have sat in many a boardroom at Dorian where you say something and then it's repeated by Mr. Richard somewhere and they're like, oh, as Richard says. You know, we, you know there is a phrase that we have coined uh, where we say, he pitted, like repeated, he pitted. So somebody repeats exactly what you have said. If you are the man in the boardroom, say, no, 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 but 
so and so Lungi has just said that it's not just it's not just Richard. And if you are very clear and forward about such small things, you will see that the culture in the workplace where you are as an, as, as as men, it would it would also start to change. I think the other thing where we feel we are excluded is in men's social gatherings. So there are some social gatherings or outings where where it's it's mainly for men. If you can, please include women in those social gatherings because we know that actually. The corporate corporate balance sheets are made at times in the in the social gatherings and where you can have uh, women there it would be it would be ideal the, the 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 thing that holds many women back in 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 executive roles even when when we want them to transition from operational to executive roles is often we bring in not necessarily that is needed we bring in their personal circumstances into the professional circumstances. And these two, uh, whilst they are not mutually exclusive, they, this doesn't need, need, need to determine the other. So don't necessarily bring in my personal circumstances to work because it's not necessarily in, in needed. The last one, Dorian, just okay, again for the audience in this room or in the, the virtual audience is sexual harassment. Just be mindful of sexual harassment. Never take it lightly because when somebody is reporting it, it means it is violated their space and please do not take it lightly. That's the duty that men could play in the corporate space to advance women. Thank you, Dr. Samuel. Chris, would you, uh, like, would you like to wrap up with yours and then over to you, Sam? I, I can't beat that. Samuel, that was great advice. Thank you. And I will take all of it to heart. Okay. Thank you. Doreen, I think um, I pondered what you said. I think, you know, I value my team. I think I, I, I love and care for my team, my people. You know, one of the KPIs I measure is my attrition. I've been proud of my very low attrition rates over the years. I've got uh, so many people that I'm loyal to and they're loyal to me. So it goes beyond just, you know, the organization. And, and, and together, funny enough, we actually develop great plans and we build great businesses. And, you know, as I reflect for many years, I would have this verse on my desk for probably six to seven years was Philippians 4 verse 8. You know, it says, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, thinks about, think about these things. And, you know, I think that makes a difference because I see 95% of people focus on the, the negative aspects of people in their business. You know, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong, you can do this better. I think if we lift each other up, we see the gold in people, they'll see it in themselves and they'll rise to the occasion. And that way you build a powerful organization with empowered people and you apply God's values, you'd be amazed at how those powerful people can grow and develop your business. Thank you. Amen. Over to you, Sam. So, so great, so great, everybody. Um, I, I can see my, my, my connections having some challenges as well. So bro, uh, take over if I freeze, but just for me to say, wow, this has been really informative, inspirational. Um, I look up to both of you as, as my big sister and my big brother in corporate and, and really taking some lessons uh, for myself in terms of, you know, God, what have you called me to do and called me to be in, in the corporate space that, that I, uh, that I occupy. So really thank you everybody. Thank you, Dorian, for uh, the questions um, to the team at the back, um, Charles and, uh, and Dave. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you to, to our audience for joining us on this uh, engaging conversation. And I pray that God would empower us to, to, to change the face of corporate, that, that corporate can change the face of this economy um, to a caring and sharing economy. I'm gonna close this up in prayer. And um, next week, we won't be on YouTube, different congregations may be doing um, different things, but we should be back with you in two weeks time and looking forward to it. Let me close in prayer. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for the corporates that you've called us to. Thank you that you give us influence that you give us a platform to build your kingdom Lord God and that um, we can use stewardship and an excellent work to to really bring your kingdom to this nation in Jesus name amen amen thank you so much everybody thank you guys thank you. thanks very much Keith.
Have a great evening. You too. Thank God you. bless you and thank you audience for joining us and uh, we'll see you in two weeks time. Bless you.